Hi, everyone. This is Lisa Roberts, the Executive Director of the Florida Wildfire Foundation. Welcome to our webinar. I'm glad you could join us today. We're really excited to have um, Jeff Nor Norsini with us today. Next slide. In case you're new to us, uh, we protect, connect, and expand native wildfire habitats throughout the state through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. You can find out more about our work and a whole lot more about wildfires on our website at www.flawildflowers.org. Next. This is brought to you by the State Wildflower License Plate, which funds research, education, planting projects statewide. And whether you have the old plate or the new one, the new design here, you are helping to plant wildflowers statewide. Next. So a few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, all attendees are muted with their cameras off. Um, and this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on youtube.com slash FLA wildflowers and flawildflowers.org in about 24 hours. So questions may be submitted via the Q&A feature at any point, and we will be answering those at the end of the presentation presentation as time permits. So if your question is not answered, you can email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org and we'll try to get it to Jeff. Next slide. So um, we're really happy to have Jeff with us today. Um, Jeff is a consultant for the Florida Wildflower Foundation through his firm, Echo Hort LLC. He provides native wildflower expertise in establishment and management of the sustainable plantings, seed dormancy, and germination and production. He's also a consultant for the Florida Department of Transportation, where he provides assistance in matters regarding wildflowers, native plants, and general horticulture. Before establishing Echo Hort, Jeff was a faculty member with the University of Florida, and he earned his bachelor's degree in biology at Lock Haven University and his master's and PhD degrees in horticulture at Penn State. Jeff, thanks for, for um, being here with us today and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Okay, let's get this up here. And it looks okay on your end, Stacy. I am not seeing it on my end. Okay. Oh, oh I didn't share it. That's why. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> okay. Now you should see it, right? Yep. Looks good. And it's not the presenter view, correct? It is not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, while this presentation is, is focused on, on small gardens, the basic principles apply to larger plantings as well. And if there's one thing that you can remember, it's weeds. That's going to be the major reason why plantings fail. Whether it be a small planting, a large planting, or any type of planting, it's going to be the weeds is what you've really got to pay attention to. But I'll talk about more about that later. Um, just a disclaimer, um, I am going to be mentioning some products, but I want to be sure that you're aware of that. And when we're talking about wildfire gardens, it could be something small like this. This happens to be Lisa's side yard or something a little bit larger. Um, this is uh, the front of my house. Um, it's, this, was, this was way back in 2004 or five. Um, and th this is sort of a mini meadow. But what I'm talking about can be, you can use um, the, the uh, methods that I'm talking about for something this large not much larger than this, or or for the you know a small wildfire garden. Either way, uh, the methods I'll be talking about will work fine for either one of these. Um, if you want to have success with a wildfire garden, it's you have to uh, you need full sun. Most wildflowers need at least six or seven hours of full sun. A little bit of shade mid to late afternoon is not a bad thing. It takes a little stress off of it, but for the most part, you need full sun. Um, at least six or seven hours of it, a well-drained soil, um, adequate soil moisture. It, it can't be bone dry unless you're trying to go 
grow cactus and there are some native cacti. Um, and you want to use the right plant for the right place. And as I mentioned before, you've got to take care of the weeds. Um, that's going to be probably your number one reason for planting failure, especially when you're uh, trying to establish by seed. Weeds can take over really quickly. Um, it's you know, enough about that. Anyway, so let's say you've got you, you found your ideal site where you want to plant or a potential site, because not all potential sites are ideal, you know, will work well, but um, I will talk about that later. Um, but you've got a potential site. So the next thing you want to do is select the appropriate species for your planting. Um, and there's some good resources. Uh, the Florida Plant Atlas will give you distribution maps. Florida Native Plant Society has some excellent information about plants um, down to the county level. You can select um, the, the type of wildflower, uh, whether it's good for bees and butterflies, um, you know, what grows in your county. Um, and then another range map uh, that I've used sometimes is called Bonap. It also gives you range maps and show you where these uh, native wildflowers occur. So you have to pick the, the, the plants that are going to do well in your region. But these are three good resources for um, finding out what will work um, in your particular part of the state. Now, what affects performance of the wildflowers? Number one is genetics. Um, it, it really predetermines the, the level of, you know, how well these um, wildflowers will perform. The, the genetics codes for all aspects of plant performance, under what conditions will plant grow, flower and set seed, under what conditions will they thrive, not just survive. You want plants that are gonna thrive, not just sort of hang on. Um, for some plants, the genetics allows for a lot of flexibility. For example, some plants will thrive under a wide variety of conditions, while some plants only thrive under very specific conditions. Uh, for example, a wildflower um, that you could find in some parts of this state, uh, uh, the panhandle, the columbine, only grows in shade. So if you try to put a columbine, for example, in full sun, it may survive for a little while, but it's not really going to really thrive. And you want wildfires that are going to thrive and, and do what they're supposed to do and look nice. The other point um, about uh, that can affect plant performance is the genetic diversity um, within that population. So when you have seeds, you want to make sure they're genetically diverse. So you have genetically diverse plants. Um, the more genetic diversity there is, the more likely it is to be a sustainable population of, of whatever you're planting. Um, if, if, for example, you had clones, which means everything's genetically identical, if one does, if a disease hits one plant, they're all equally susceptible, it could wipe out your entire population. Or if they're not, you know, if a particular type of um, wildflower, that you know, they're all genetically the same. If it's susceptible to drought, it wipes, not only wipes out one, but it makes them all very susceptible to drought, they could all be wiped out. Whereas if you have genetic diversity, you may lose some plants, but the rest of the plants survive and um, it, it's not too much of a hit. So with seed, you don't want to, when you're uh, planting seed, you don't want to plant a clone um, because you, it, it's very risky. They all may look great. Like for example, the, uh, the one here on the right, the Texas wildfire looks great. It's more, it doesn't have as much of a diverse, you know, it's not as diverse, it looks great, but um, it's more susceptible um, to, um, things here in Florida. Um, and also the plant origin makes a difference. Um, for example, um, the one from North Florida, not quite as showy. The one from Texas is much showier, but we even ran some tests on that when I was with the University of Florida. Um, the North Florida ecotype, the ones that was derived from populations in North Florida, um, they weren't quite as showy, but they flowered throughout the summer and into the fall. This one from Texas, peaked out early in the season and it died. Uh, and that was either under um, ideal conditions, guard conditions, or um, basically low input conditions where it didn't have much water or fertilizer. So um, the plant origin does make a difference. Okay. Covered that, okay. Something else you need to consider with wildflowers is how aggressive are they? Um, for example, I started a population of, of the wild petunia. I started, I started over here 
way back over here where it was shaded. I normally thought these were shade plants. So I put them under where it didn't get much afternoon sun. And there was just that, I, I actually started these eight or 10, well, there was about a dozen plants, but I started them over in this region and they have all spread into full sun. Um, it's a very aggressive species. Some people won't even plant wild petunia because it is very aggressive. If you do happen to use wild petunia, realize it can grow all over the place. Um, it, it spreads very rapidly, but I'm fine with that plus it's a low growing plant. It gives me flowers all summer. Uh, starts in late spring, it dies back in the winter, it comes back in, it comes back in the spring, um, but it gives me a lot of showy flowers. It's low and compact all season, you know, basically all summer long. Um, the butterflies like it, the bees like it, and I like it, and it's very drought tolerant. But the important point is it is aggressive. Um, it will spread very rapidly by seed. Um, I don't know why it's, and I'm, I guess it's animals. I don't know what's spreading it, but it does spread very really quickly. It didn't take long to spread into full sun. And I was really, a, I was really surprised it spread into full sun because it's normally considered a shade plant or, a, or something that only let, prefers um, bright light and not really full sun, but it's, it's drought tolerant as anything I better have in my front yard. Um, it's got a very dense root system. But anyway, just watch out with aggressive species. Um, I want it to spread. So if you're dealing with an aggressive species, make sure you, you have, have, um, have room for it to um, spread. Something else to consider when you're um, selecting wildflowers, the flowering time varies across the state. For example, Leavenworth coreopsis could be flowering in the winter time or spring, early spring down in South Florida, but it's not going to flower in the late spring or summer here in the Panhandle. Uh, we're on that in Tallahassee. Um, also, what I've seen, uh, especially in gardens, you may have earlier flowering of, of plants than what you would normally see in the wild. So if you're looking at a book and reading when does it flower, it may be you know two or three weeks earlier than, than what you may find um, in a textbook, for example. If you've got larval plants, they will get eaten. We've got passion flower in our backyard and it gets chewed to pieces by the caterpillars, but that's what it's there for. So you have to realize that uh, or be aware of that. Plants is spread vegetatively. Don't try to contain them, let them spread. If they're going to spread vegetatively and you don't want them to, don't put them in your um, landscape. And the appearance of the planting will vary year to year, especially when you've got, you know, well, especially in a case of, of you've got multiple species. Um, some plants will do better one year than another year. So the look can change from year to year. It's unlikely it's going to look the same from year to year when you've got multiple species in there. And just an example here, um, this is a the milkweed and the, the uh, monarch butterflies will chew, you know, they'll chew that foliage to pieces. Same as passion flower, the, the, uh, the fritillaries and the zebra long wings will, will chew up the foliage pretty well. And as it's just an example of how the look can change from year to year, this was the way my planting originally looked. And this is a year or two ago, I added other species, but it does change from year to year. It never looks the same from year to year, which is fine with me. I like the diversity. Now, moving on to site preparation. Um, <clears throat> this is really important. What I would suggest is to use solar, so, soil solarization. That's, you're essentially pasteurizing the soil. Um, but this has to be done um, late spring or early summer, and that plastic has to stay in place for six to eight weeks. You're essentially using the greenhouse effect to heat up that soil so it kills the weed seeds. Um, it's very effective at killing weed seeds. You have to use clear plastic. Um, the basic procedure is sometime in you know, late May, early June is to till up the soil. Um, you don't necessarily need to kill anything, but just till up the soil at least eight to, you know, at least eight or 10 inches deep, the deeper, the better. Um, after that soil is tilled, you slightly moisten the soil and then till it again. So you've got that moisture throughout the soil profile. The reason for um, slightly moistening that soil is that moist heat will carry the temperature throughout that soil profile, will radiate that temperature. Um, well, yeah, it, the temperature will be um, distributed throughout that soil, soil profile better if you have slightly moist soil because that, that moist air um, conducts the heat throughout that soil, soil profile better 
than dry soil. If you have dry soil, you're not going to get that heat necessarily deep, deep down into the soil. Also, moist heat is very effective at killing you know, any kind of seed. So seeds do not like warm, moist heat. Um, it tends to kill the seed. Um, the plastic has to be clear and it has to be left in place six to eight weeks. When you put that plastic on, um, that clear plastic, you have to make sure it's tucked in all the way around so that it's not gonna be blown away by a thunderstorm. It has to stay in place and you don't want any leaks. Now, how does this work? The reason for having clear plastic, it's because of the greenhouse effect. Same thing has happened you know, with your car sitting out in the sun, it gets so hot. That's because the UV rays go through the glass or the plastic and it's converted into um, basically infrared radiation, which heats up the, which heats up un underneath the clear plastic. And that uh, underneath the plastic, um, it can get upwards in, in the low 100, 100, 110 easily, and, you know, near the top few inches of soil and a little, not quite as warm deeper down, but it was, will still be very warm um, underneath that plastic. So it has to be clear plastic and you need to leave it in place at least six to eight weeks. It must be done in the summertime. Um, start sometime in late May, early June, and then leave it in place. Basically, leave it in place until you're ready to sow your seed. Uh, when you're ready to sow the, you know, sow the seed, you leave that plastic in place until you're ready to sow the seed. Then you just rake out that soil, rake off the debris and any large clods of soil. And the reason, just a reason why we're doing this is um, and I just want to show you what can you know what can exist in your in in your soil um, because that's the major source of your seeds. It's not um, the existing it's not the existing weeds, or, um, but it's what lies beneath. This is a fallow field of um, bahia grass that I, that I conducted an experiment 15, 20 years ago. It looks good. There were very few weeds, so you think this is an ideal site. But when we look below. Um, we actually found, you know, hundreds to thousands of seeds in that top few inches of soil. So don't assume, you know, if you, you have a nice layer of turf or bahia grass, um, you could be have, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of seeds in that top few inches of soil. And when you disturb that soil, those seeds will come up. At least some of them will come up, and you can get swamped out by by weeds. So that the soil solarization is very effective at taking out those weed seeds in, in the top few inches of soil. Um, so you've got a really good site where you're not going to get weed competition. I can't overemphasize that enough. The major source of seed uh, of, of weeds is the soil seed bank, not something that's being blown in, um, not what's what's existing. So for example, if you say I have weeds, I'll just kill them with Roundup. Um, you're all, only taking care of the tip of the iceberg. Um, the, the problem is the soil seed bank, and that's what you have to address. Now, in some cases, you don't want to, if you don't want to do this, if you don't want to do soil solarization, you just want to do minimal site prep, then <clears throat> you do need to look for an area that's basically bahia grass. Um, now, bahia grass, you know, and you don't see any major weeds, even though there could be a lot, lot beneath. And this is a case where you may end up using um, Roundup to, to kill the grass. You've got to find some way to kill that grass, or you're going to have a competition. Now, if you have centipede grass or St. Augustine grass, um, that's a situation where you're going to need to go in there with an herbicide, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but the ideal site, if you want to do really minimal site prep and you're just knocking out the grass, um, is something like this, where you, you see few to no weeds. If you're going to do minimal site prep and you know just using Roundup, for example, um, you want to avoid a weedy site. If there was a, a you know several hundred to a thousand seed in a in a Val Bahia field, there's, it could be easily triple that. So if you've got a front yard that looks like this, you've got to sell or so you've got to use a solarization or you're going to end up with a weed patch. You really don't have any choice. Um, it's, it's not worth doing if you have a site like this or you've got a lot of this, uh, the Mexican clover. Um, that's that you can, you can mow it, but um, they keep putting seed into the seed bank. I would avoid any, you know, if you're doing minimal site preparation, you know, just using Roundup, for example, I'd avoid any areas with this. This is called chamber bitter. This is a, a warm season annual. It spreads voraciously. If you've got this, you know, one, more than one or two in your yard, um, this will spread very quickly. So I avoid sites with that. 
And like I mentioned, the Mexican clover, whether it be the, there's two white flowered species. There's also in the pan, uh, in the peninsula, the, this purple flowered um, species is, is very common, um, but both of them can spread fairly quickly. Um, basically, once they stay below the mower blades, they stay prostrate and they keep flowering and producing seed and can put a lot of seed into the seed bank. And they can basically swamp out your, your wildflower planting if you try to establish by seed because they, they creep all over the place. I also avoid sites with nut sedges, um, especially the yellow and purple nut sedge. Both of those are known to be allelopathic, which means um, the roots of these, uh, the yellow and purple nut sedge, put out a chemical or exude a chemical that leaches into the soil that can actually inhibit growth of other species. Now, it doesn't inhibit growth of every species, but it does have that allelopathic effect. And if you've got much uh, of this in your landscape and you try to establish a wildfire planting and, and you disturb the soil, and disturbing the soil or any type, um, disturbing the site essentially can be simply as, as you know, killing the weeds, um, you know, putting on it, whether it's a compact herbicide or, uh, or a systemic herbicide like Roundup, that's considered minor site disturbance and these things can flourish um, if you disturb the site. Um, they can take over very, very quickly. So I avoid sites where I see, you know, if I'm not gonna do much site prep, I avoid sites where I see nut sedges because they can take over very, very quickly. Uh, just for an example, <clears throat> there was a site one time I visited up in South Georgia, they had tilled a site and they just simply tilled the site they basically ended up with a monoculture of it was either yellow or purple nut sedge. It's just very aggressive. And then um, something else, I, I would also avoid areas where you have clover, you know, the white clover that you see there or the clover white plants. And it's not that they're so aggressive, but in the winter time, they're, they're, they're basically cool season annuals. They basically thrive um, late winter and early spring. And that's when, if you're seeding a site, that's when you have these, you know, the small wildflower seedlings, but the, the clovers and the clover-like plants can form a dense cover um, over those seedlings and just basically shade them out. And you're gonna have very poor success. So uh, with the wildflower planting. So if you've got clover in your yard um, and you're not gonna do, if, and, and you're not gonna do so, soil solarization, I would avoid it. You know, just killing these with Roundup is not gonna be enough. But if you tend to have a site with clovers or the clover-like plants, whether it be or like the black medics or the bird clovers, I would tend to avoid those sites because it's, it's, it will swamp out your wildflower seedlings. And I avoid this one as well. The, the green briars, um, the only, they can just climb over your wildflowers. Um, if you only have one or two in your, in your site, that's fine. But the only way to get rid of them, herbicide's not gonna to touch it. Um, you actually, because it, they have these big tubers underneath, you know, six, eight inches down, you actually have to dig them up to actually get rid of them. Um, they can have a really big tuberous system, tuberous uh, root system. You, you have to dig those up. And the blackberries and the dewberries, um, they're good for pollinators in the springtime. They're native. They have this nice showy flower. The bees love them. But um, over time, I've got them in my yard. I kind of keep pulling them out. Um, they, they, do, they can climb over your wildflowers. So if you're not going to do much site prep and you've got these in your yard, be aware you're going to con be constantly pulling these out. The other thing that's just more of a pain in the neck more than anything else, if you've got these in your yard, I mean, in your wildflower planting and you're weeding, it's no fun to grab one of these, but with your bare hands, um, you end up with a handful of stickers. So um, while they do have some benefit, um, just, you know, if you've got a lot of these, or you've got a few of these, it can spread really quickly. Now, as far as sowing your seed, um, if in your North Florida, basically Gainesville, or I'd say the Panhandle, just north of Gainesville or across, well, across the Jacksonville, I would suggest sowing in mid-September to late October um, on most of your wildflower seeds. If, if you've got some fall blooming wildflowers, um, like some of the, like Golden Roger, things like that, or, or Leatris, you can sow them a little bit later, but you have to get them in early. I've had very good success planting in, in mid to late September or early October with um, sowing the seeds in North Florida during those dates. And Central Florida, you can wait a little bit later 
and South Florida, you can even wait later than that. These are just suggested times. Um, you know, if you sowed them in October, that would be good. It, you know, if you had to pick one time, I would pick sometime in mid-October. The other reason I, I like to sow, in, especially up in North Florida, um, is we're still getting some summer rains um, and they do, do, do need moisture. So you have to consider that. If you know you're going into a drought, uh, not the time to plant wildflowers and you know try to establish a garden unless you're gonna um, you know, water it with a sprinkler. And that just brings up one other point. Um, if you are gonna water, if you're gonna um, supplement the irrigation, that's fine. Um, but you wanna use something with a, a very, something no more than the, uh, watering with a, a sprinkler head. You don't, want, you don't wanna be splashing that water on there. It will, it will disturb the, the, the um, seeds and then it could end up burying them. But um, you wanna do that with a, like a sprinkler type and, and at least for a few hours. When you do irrigate, you want to irrigate at least so you're getting a you know a third to a half inch of water on there um, so you're really soaking it and doing that um, maybe once a week at least for a few weeks until the, the wildflowers come up um, and then you can taper it off now before sowing the seed going back to that you need to have a firm seed bed um, the reason is you do not want the seed to get more than a, a quarter inch deep um, now this, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, if they get to, if they get a half inch down, you're going to have very poor uh, emergence. Um, they may germinate, but they won't have the energy to get to the top. You know, they won't have the energy to emerge out of the soil. Um, for a small garden, you can simply walk over it, and and just so you have a nice firm seed bed. Whatever method you need, I would not drive any vehicles over it. Um, you know, if it's a small garden, just walk over the whole thing so you have a firm seed bed. The goal is to have that seed in the top, you know, eight to a quarter inch. Half inch down is too deep. Um, you've got that sandy soil, make sure it's firm. So that's really important. The seed has to stay shallow. Um, not only because if it's if it gets too deep, it won't have the energy to emerge, but a lot of the small seeded wildflowers actually need light to stimulate germination. So they Basically, if you push them, you know, if they're just remaining in that top layer of soil where you can barely see them, that's plenty deep. Uh, and, you know, an eighth to a quarter of inch at the most. So that's really important. And so you have to have that firm seed bed um, initially so that they're, they're not going to sink too deep into the soil. And then as far as applying the seed, um, you can use it, a, a, you know, a whirly bird seeder like you see here on the left. Um, something for a small planting. I simply um, use this, the bucket method. And with the bucket method, <clears throat> excuse me, what I do is I'll fill a seed, um, I'll fill a, a five gallon bucket halfway with either um, like a, a coarse vermiculite or sand. Then I slightly moisten that sand or vermiculite. And then I'll take half my seed and then put it into that bucket. And then I'll thoroughly mix it. Um, so. So if you, you get that salt and pepper look, if you've got a, a white, you know, if you've got a white sand, but you have to thoroughly mix that seed into that sand. Um, there's two reasons for doing that. Um, slightly moistening the soil helps the seed to stick to the, the carrier, whether it be vermiculite or sand. Um, the other reason is even if you're seeding at a very high rate, that amount of seed, it will be very difficult to uh, spread that amount of seed over the entire planting area. So this is the, the sand or the vermiculite is basically a diluent. So you can have a lot more material to spread out over your, you know, your wildfire gardening, the garden that you're planting. Um, I've done up to a quarter acre on this. It takes a long time, but um, you can do up to a quarter acre, you, you know, using this method. Um, and then what I normally do is I normally split my seed in half. So I spread all the seed over the entire area and then I, you know, do the other half and spread it over the area again. The other advantage of using um, the sand or vermiculite, you know exactly where that seed's been planted because you can see the sand or vermiculite. If you're just spreading the seed by hand, you're never going to see that seed on the ground or it'll be very difficult. But this enables you to see where you've actually planted that seed. And then after you plant that seed, you've got to push it into that top layer of soil. Um, you could just walk over it as fine with flat soled shoes. Um, but the, the goal is to get it into that top layer of soil. Plus, a soil to seed contact is crucial. 
because that's the only way that seed will absorb absorb the moisture, uh, whether it's you know artificial irrigation or rain. So you've got to have that soil to seed contact, so it can take up the uh, so the seed can take up the moisture um, through capillary action. So that's really important. Now, as I mentioned, weeds is going to be the major issue. If you solarized, you're rarely going to have a weed problem. Um, I've solar. I've I've seen one example where I've um, when I've done solarization, it even took out nut sedges. You do have tend to have some weeds around the edges um, uh, where, where you where you've solarized the soil, but for the most part, it's basically weed free. If you want to use um, a chemical like an herbicide, that is your last resort, whether it be a glyphosate product. Um, I, I do use a post-emergent grass herbicide called Grass Be Gone because it only kills grasses and will not touch the wildflowers. I still have centipede grass coming up in my wildflower, uh, my mini meadow, what, 15, 18 years after I planted it. So it, it's just, I'm trying to minimize disturbance. So it's easier for me just to use a grass herbicide but you can also pull it up. Um, but the grass herbicides are fine for taking out any type of grass you have in there. Um, there's also contact herbicides, essentially herbicidal soaps, which are analogous to the uh, herbicide, herbic uh, the, um, the, er the, um, the soaps you use to kill um, in insects, essentially the same thing. Or you can go with an organic herbicide, um, like acetic acid, which is basically vinegar. Um, now, with those contact herbicides, it only kills what it touches. The grass herbicide and the glyphosate will kill the entire plant. The, the herbicidal soap or the organic herbicides only kills what it touches. It does not kill the entire plant. Well, it won't kill below growth. They're only good for annuals. If you've got nut sedges, or, you know, for example, the, the herbicidal soap or, or the organic herbicide will, will only kill the top growth, not, not what's underneath. But that's a last resort. Um, and I would recommend hand weeding when the weeds are small. Something else I forgot to mention before I go any further, when you're hand seeding um, or any kind of seeding is to, um, in one corner of the plot, is to mark off a small area where you, you seed in you know, some kind of a pattern. For example, like seed in a pattern like an X, and then you mark the site, you, know, you flag that site so you can monitor What's coming up, and you know the wildflower seeds are in the, you know, in the in in the uh, in, in an X pattern, uh, for example, or whatever pattern you plant. So you know what the wildflowers look like, as opposed to they may look just like the weeds. So at least you know what your your wildflowers, you know, your young seedlings look like when they come up. If you plant them in a small pattern in one corner of the plot, so that if you need to hand weed, um, you at least know what the wildflower looks like and what a weed looks like. Or if you know what the wildfires look like, you know anything else can be pulled out. And if you're using any kind of an herbicide, you always want to, um, I always recommend applying it as early in the morning as possible after the dew has dried. The reason being is that's where you're going to get your best absorption of uh, uptake of the herbicide into the plant. Um, Make sure, it, you know, if you're in the middle of a drought, don't apply it to, you know, stressed weeds because if they're not going to take it up. It's going to be very ineffective. Only use it as spot sprays. No, there's no reason to apply a post-emergent herbicide as a broadcast. Only spray what you need and make sure that wind is low. If it's windy out, don't even consider spraying anything. It will drift onto your desirable plants um, and make sure it's not going to rain. These herbicides need to be on the plant at least an hour before it rains and do not use any product that provide, you know, it says on the label it provides pre-emergent residual or extended weed control, unless that could, um, that could actually prevent your wildflowers from germinating. Um, because it may have, it may, yeah, it may negatively impact your, you know, your wheat, I mean, your wildflower seed. And when using any chemical, always read and follow label directions and more is not better. If it says to use two ounces per gallon, you don't think, well, I could uh, have a better job if I use it three ounces per gallon. Do not do that. Um, it's more is never better when you're using any kind of a chemical. Um, it's just don't do it. Um, something else to consider when you're planting native species. Um, natives, you know, generally do better than non-natives in landscapes. However, you can't assume the same stress and pest tolerance. 
um, as you would see in a natural habitat. The soil around your home, um, it's, it's not a natural habitat. It's, it may be fill dirt, the topsoil may be removed. So you don't have all the benefits that you'd find in the natural, envi a natural environment. All the natural bacteria, fungi, and mycorrhizae that, 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 that coexist with the wildflowers out in the wild, you don't have those in, in your home landscape. So don't necessarily assume it's a native plant, you know, it's a native wildfire, so I'm not gonna have to worry about stress. I'm not gonna have to worry, you know, it's gonna be more stress tolerant than a non-native. That's not necessarily true. The same goes for pests, but just don't assume that, um, that the natives will perform better than a non-native because you're not planting it into a natural habitat. And if you forget to weed and you haven't solarized, you can end up with a weed patch. Um, that, there was a beautiful wildfire planting. Um, they didn't weed and this is what happens. The crabgrass completely took over. And this, you're not gonna get this with sol you know, solarized sites, but you will get this if you've just, for example, planted a larger site and you just uh, killed the grass with, you know, Roundup or something, you've got all that soil in the seed bank and all those weed seed in the seed bank and you could end up something like that. And finally, um, you've got to make, you know, these are low maintenance, not no maintenance plantings. Um, if uh, that, I would suggest mowing them back late in the fall or early winter, whether it's a mower or a string trimmer, you know, leave at least four to six inches of stubble. Um, you can always add something to it. I've, I add species, you know, every few years just to change it up. Um, and if you want winter interest, consider um, either planting some native grasses or seeding some na native grasses. Um, they may turn brown in the winter. Uh, sometimes um, a lot of the, the blue stems, they have various, there are various shades of brown or reddish brown that can actually be quite pretty in the fall and, and through the winter. So consider native grasses to provide interest um, just you know, from fall through winter, if you want to add some interest to your wildfire garden. And um, I just want to go over some seeds, um, some species that you may want to consider. Now, this is one uh, blanket flowers, one that I would normally suggest because it's it's almost bulletproof. It's hard to fail with this one. However, um, as of early this year, it is no longer considered native uh, to Florida. So if you've got it, I mean, I I still have a few in my yard. Um, they, they're aggressive, they're pretty, they're, uh, and they do attract native pollinators. I've always seen, I always see bees and butterflies on mine, but just keep, be aware that this is no longer considered na a native species to Florida, although it is a, still a good plant for pollinators. The only native gallardia that we have in the state now is lanceleaf black blanket flower. You'll find that um, from the panhandle into, into central Florida, but that's the only native gallardia we have now is lanceleaf blank blanket flower. Something else I love, um, it's very, you know, a high degree of success with it, although it is aggressive, it will spread, is the, the spotted bee balm. There, it gives you, a, you know, it can get pretty tall. In my yard, um, I have a, a sandy clay, it will get four feet tall. It, it comes on, pretty, it gets pretty big and spreads quickly, but it is a, it has beautiful flowers. The flowers are actually these honeycomb, it's also called dotted horsemen. These are the actual flowers and the pink parts or the, the purple parts and the, that black color can vary anywhere from purple to almost a faint purplish pink. Uh, they're almost white, um, it, but it's a beautiful plant and the bees absolutely love it. Basically anything that stings will be on that plant. Although they will not disturb you. I've walked right by these plants in, in the late summer um, and it's, they don't care. And just to give you an idea, this is something I did a year or two ago, and you can see the bumblebees. I mean, basically anything that stings will be on there from hornets to wasps, to little bees, the bumblebees, but they really don't care. They are so enamored with um, getting the nectar out of those, um, the flowers. But it, it, it's, um, once you've got it, it, it will spread very rapidly for you um, and, and it's an easy one to grow. Uh, Black-eyed Susan, that's another good plant. Um, make sure you buy the, you know, from the Florida Wildflower Kia, Kia, uh, co op so you're getting the North Florida or, or you're getting a Florida ecotype. Um, in the panhandle, um, the naturally occurring ones are, the naturally occurring Black-eyed Susan are upland plants. They like it on the dry side. If you're in Central and South Florida, make sure you get it from a, a dealer that's in Central and South Florida. 
uh, because in Central and South Florida, these prefer moist areas. The, the naturally occurring ones occur in moist environments, moist prairie. So if you're in Central and South Florida, make sure you get a source of, of seed or plants um, that actually um, are derived from Central or South Florida, but they like it on the moist side in South Florida or Central Florida. Um, Leverworth takes seed as a good one, but it does need uh, slightly moist soil. It doesn't have to be wet, but it will tolerate inundation. That's one of our um, state wildflowers. Um, there's actually 15 or 16 native Coreopsis, um, but Coreopsis is our state wildflower. But this definitely needs moisture. It's not going to do well on a dry site. It needs a little bit of moisture. It doesn't need a lot, but it definitely has to have a, a slightly moist soil. It's not going to tolerate drought. And this is a summer flowering plant. And it reseeds very well. Not aggressive, though. And then landscape Coreopsis for the central, I mean, for the panhandle into central Florida. And make sure you get a, a Florida ecotype. The common garden variety, which you get through some of the large seed companies, um, like Wildfire Seed or American Meadows, you're going to end up with this. <clears throat> this does not, the, the common garden variety does not normally flower the first year from seed, but you always want to plant the native one, which is short. Um, and make you, the co-op should have this, the, the, the Florida Wildfire Seed Co-op um, at floridawildfires.org or .com should have this, um, but it's short um, and it does much better over the long run. It's also, a, it's more of a, a short-term perennial. Um, it's an evergreen and it will last two or three years before it dies out and reseeds, but it, it's also a good reseeder. But it's shorter, it's, very, it's a very pretty wildflower. And if you want something different, the rayless sunflower, it's basically a little ball on a stick. Um, it's excellent for plant for um, flower arrangements, plus you have no leaves on the stem. But it's actually it's it's a it's a sunflower without the showy petals. Um, so it's basically all disc flowers, and I'll show you what that what I mean by that in a minute. And there you can see a native bee and full of pollen on the uh, I guess those are pollen sacs, whatever they are. And this can be anywhere. It almost appears black, but actually it's a dark purple. But that's that's the entire flower right there. And what I mean by disc flowers, um, plants and the daisy family have two types of flowers. The showy petals are actually ray flowers. The fertile flowers are the ones in the middle. Those are the disc flowers. And that's what produces the seeds. So anything in the daisy family um, has to show you each one of the each one of these petals is actually a flower. Um, and they're normally fertile, I mean, sterile, but the disc flowers in the center, each one of these, there's a lot, you know, you know hundreds of, of well, maybe not hundreds, but a lot of disc flowers in the middle. Those are the fertile flowers. Um, tiny little florets, if you were to look at them up closely. <clears throat> and the last one I want to mention is um, sunshine mimosa. Great flowers in the spring. And it's also a good substitute for turf. I actually planted it to hold down my weeds and it's done a very good job of holding down any broadleaf weed I ever had. So um, that took care of my weed issue because it, it really does provide good coverage. <clears throat> Once you have it established, it grows very quickly. Uh, it's aggressive. So if you plant it, just realize it's aggressive. Um, I, every, every, oh, every three or four weeks, I have to trim it off the curb unless it grows over the curb into the, the gutter. So I have to um, trim it back. But it's aggressive, but it is very showy. Makes it, it's a great ground cover, great substitute for turf, um, and it is it's an um, herbaceous um, perennial. It does it dies back in the um, winter time in areas that get frost or freezes, and it comes back in the spring. If you're in South Florida, it may be evergreen, and the honeybees like it. They love it, as a matter of fact. And if you do plant this, the seed have to be scarified. It has a very hard seed coat. Water cannot get in. <clears throat> so actually what you have to do is either um, rub it like on sandpaper or an emery board, just enough to break the coating so that water can get in. Uh, or you can nick the seed with a little fingernail clipper. Don't do it near the tip. You do it towards, sort of towards the back end, the wide end. Um, once you've created a tiny hole in there, the water will, will get in there and, act, and then the seed will swell. An easy way to test that is um, if you're using sandpaper or an emery board, it's just to sand off a few seeds, see how long it takes to do that. Then you put them in a shallow dish of water 
And if they swell up within, you know, an hour, you know, you, you, you know, whatever method you used was enough. If they don't swell up, you need, you, you know, you need to rub, you know, sand it or emery board it a little bit more. Or if you, you, nick, you know, just nick it with a fingernail clipper, that's enough. Um, but all you need is a tiny little hole and that water will penetrate. And these seeds come up within a few days. Once you, you, you've nicked that seed coat, these seeds will come up within a few days. And there's the two license tags that, uh, for the foundation. And questions? Jeff, we, we have a ton of questions. I, I figured that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen because I, I have a resource for everybody. Okay, so okay, my screen's off now, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and and what I'm showing you is a, a handout that we have available on our website. If you go to flawildflowers.com/planting, this is on our carousel. It is on the uh, when you when you scroll down the page, you'll see publications, and there are three dots under it. If you click on that third dot, this publication is there, and you will be able to download it. And uh, Jeff um, helped us prepare this um, several years ago, um, just for people who wanted to start um, wildflower gardens from seed. And I actually used um, this method to start my own. Um, so it's 12 steps, um, things to uh, keep in mind. It does, um, I don't know if it does go into solarization, but we also have a um, article on our website on solarization. So if you go to our website and um, use the search tool, just plug in solarization, you will find the article. He, um, he talks about it a little bit right here with covering it in clear plastic from um, three to six. Uh, millimeters thick. So I uh, just wanted to um, get that uh, resource out there for um, downloading. Yeah, and one uh, thing about solarization, you're only limited by the size of your plastic. Like I have, I could have done solarization in my front yard. I I chose not to, but uh, because this is way back before I was, you know, started, you know, talking about solarization, but um, it will, you know, it's, you're only limited by the size of plastic that you have. Right. And actually that, that was uh, one of the questions is what about a larger planting area when sol solarization is not practical? So, you know, certain situations, you, you know, you'll have a, a pretty large area and you won't be able to, to cover it completely in, um, in plastic. What, what do you do then? In that case, you may, you know, um, first of all, if it's a weedy area, if you, see, if, if you see many broadleaf weeds, or let's put it this way, if it's bahia grass, and you see broadleaf plants, whether you, whether you consider them weeds or not. And by the way, weeds is something, if there's no botanical definition of weeds, it's simply a plant you don't want. But if you see broadleaf plants in, in your, you know, more than a few, um, I would stay away from it simply because you're not gonna be able to solarize and get rid of the, you know, the, the seed in the soil seed bank. You could go, the only option then in my opinion is just to go with, you know, a glyphosate product and, and do it in the fall. So you, uh, it's uh, glyphosate products are much more effective at killing grass in the fall than they are in the spring. Um, and then the one thing you don't want to do um, when you've used the glyphosate is make sure you, you minimize disturbance. Once that, you know, once it's the, um, this, the grass is dead, you may need a second application, but you're basically doing it right before you're going to, you know, a, a few weeks before you're going to sow the seed. Um, and then you just lightly rake off the dead thatch. You actually, if you, you know, if you have a bahia grass field or centipede, um, you're just going to know to leave about an inch of stubble. Then you lightly rake with a leaf rake, not a landscape rake. But you know, the more you disturb the soil, the more the you know the likelihood of the weeds coming up. You just lightly rake that off or blow it off, which is even better. And that's and you can sow into that. Um, but if you've got a really large site or what you can do with a large site is just do some strips of soil solarization, um, you know, whatever your plastic you, you know, whatever, you know, like I said before, you're only limited by the size of your plastic. And after you've got those strips established, you know, just let them grow, you know, start once you've got your wildfire plantings in there, those, those wildfires are essentially um, showy weeds and, they, and they're colonizers and they will start to spread for you. So if you you know if you've got a large you know relatively large site maybe a quarter acre 
you could do strips of soil solarization and then sort of let everything grow together. You'd be surprised how fast they grow together. Plus these, these are, the, a lot of these wildflowers will spread easily by seed. Alrighty, um, why clear plastic only? Why not dark or black plastic? Um, green, uh, clear plastic, you have to have the greenhouse effect. The dark plastic, it gets warm, but does not get hot. Look at your car. Um, that's why you cover your car. You know, sometimes people will actually um, put those shields in there so that the UV rays do not get in there. Um, but it has to be clear because you, uh, that's the only way you get the greenhouse effect. The, sun, the UV light has to get through and that UV light is actually converted um, to long wave radiation that, that generates heat. Um, you will not get the heat uh, with black plastic as compared to clear plastic. You have to have clear plastic. You need that greenhouse effect. Look how hot a greenhouse gets. Um, that's why greenhouses, they shade the greenhouses so it doesn't get quite as hot in there. Uh, so, the, so not as much UV radiation gets through there and it's converted to heat. Um, so you've got to have clear plastic. All righty. And then uh, will soil solarization uh, damage tree roots? That's a possibility. Um, I can't say, I mean, they're not gonna appreciate the heat. Um, so I would, yeah, it, that, that's definitely a possibility. I, I, I don't know for sure, I have not read anything about that, but it's not gonna be beneficial to, to them. It, I, it, it's possible. Um, the one other thing about solarization um, that I did forget to mention is make sure there's no utility lines where you're gonna, where you're gonna rototill, whether it be a water line, a power, you know, a water line, um, a power line, a telephone line, cable, that sort of thing, sewer. Uh, just make sure that those are not in the area where you're trying to rototill. But uh, most of the, I think water's a little bit deeper, but everything else is pretty shallow. So you've got to be careful. You're not going to be cutting off a line. Okay. And then uh, what, is there anything that you need to do differently if you're solarizing over a septic drain field? Ooh. I don't even, I would not suggest it over a septic drain field. That may be interfering with how that drain field works. I would stay away from that. Okay. So um, you talked about Roundup or, or uh, glyphosate. Glyphosate, uh, there's a lot of products out there now. Correct. Um, doesn't that ruin the soil for new plants if poison and uh, residue isn't? No. Uh, and no. isn't it bad for the environment in general? Not that I'm aware of. Um, glyphosate, Basically, once you apply it, it will be tied up by the, the clay particles in the soil. It's not going to hurt your, you know, the, the seed um, that you plant, but you have to let it go. You know, you don't want to sow seed. You have to wait at least two weeks after you apply Roundup before you sow any seed. So um, earlier than that, there could be a problem. But after that, the, the, it's basically gone. You don't have to, it's tied up or it's tied up. You don't have to worry about it. But I wait at least two weeks after any application of, gly of a glyphosate product before you sow seed. Earlier than that, you could have an issue. Right, and uh, just FYI, the foundation doesn't really um, recommend the use of, of glyphosate or any other chemical. Right. And you know, if you soil solarize, you do not need to use glyphosate. I mean, you can till under that live, that live vegetation. You do not need to use glyphosate if you're solarizing. Yes, um, and somebody wants to know how to get rid of torpedo grass. Solarization will do it. Um, it, it if you're it, an herbicide, it, it, there are herbicides which will take care of it, but it's tough. Um, if it's in a landscape, if you've got torpedo grass, um, if it's if you if some places that are overwatered will get torpedo grass. Uh, you, know, you may also get dollar weed in there if it's overwatered. They basically only like it where it's wet. Um, it will creep up. You know. Sometimes you will find it in areas that, that aren't quite as wet, but it need, it really prefers moist areas. That's where it's most aggressive. Um, and those those rhizomes can get three or four inches down in the ground. Um, but if you solarize, I think that will, well, solarization takes care of nut sedge. If it takes care of nut sedge, I imagine it would take care of torpedo grass as well. Now, if you've got torpedo grass on the edge of a solarized area, it will creep into there. So you've got to make sure you, you don't have any torpedo grass left in, in an area adjacent to your solarized area or it will creep right in. Okay. Um, if you have a pollinator meadow with uh, no irrigation other than natural rain, is that a problem? And how does it affect the germination of seeds? If you don't, 
while you're always at the mercy of mother nature, if you're trying to um, start a, a planting and you don't have irrigation, then you are at the mercy of mother nature. If you don't get the rain, they're not gonna come up. The other issue is if you get, a, you know, you get one rain, they start to germinate and then you have three or four weeks without rain, that, that, that may stunt most of the, I mean, it may kill most of the seedlings because um, they started to germinate and then the rain was cut off. Um, but once you have it established, um, there's so many seed out there that enough will come through. Uh, and then plant a diversity of species um, because some species may not make it one year or they may lie dormant because of you know, lack of water or limited water, but plant a diversity of species, some that will tolerate a little more drought than others. And so you always have something in there. And, and native grasses tend to be drought tolerant. Once you have them established, um, they, a lot of them put down deep roots and are drought tolerant, so, but plant a diversity so you're not relying on one type, you know, one species that, that you know, you're, you're putting all, all, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket. Diversity is always better. Um, Great. I um, with diversity. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts about sheet mulching? Um, and I, I believe this could be mulching with cardboard and, and. People swear by it. Now, the one thing about mulching with that, if, when you put down mulch, it's also going to inhibit, inhibit, um, reseeding of your wildflowers. It's good for controlling weeds, but if it's controlling weeds, it's also gonna control your wildflowers because a lot of the wildflowers are annuals to short-lived perennials and they rely on reseeding for that population to sustain itself. If, you're, if you have perennials in there, that's a different situation. They're not putting out much seed like that some, the, the native grasses and there's some of the, the wildflowers are long-term perennials. That may be more appropriate for that but if you're relying on reseeding, you can't put down a mulch because that's going to inhibit reseeding of your wildflowers. It may control the weeds, but you're also you're going to limit the the reseeding ability of the wildflowers that rely on reseeding to sustain themselves. Correct. Um, I think that question might have been more about using cardboard to um, to suppress weeds in an area before planting. Oh, oh before planting, that will suppress weeds. The the problem is it's, you've got the soil seed bank. Um, while you may suppress seeds initially, eventually those things are gonna, you know, it's the soil seed bank you've got to worry about. Um, that, that's my concern with, with any, anything that's, you know, used to suppress weeds. It's like using Roundup, you know, you kill the existing weeds, but you, you don't take, you're not addressing the, the soil seed bank issue. That's the major source of seed and eventually they're gonna find their way up. Yeah. Okay. And then um, Suzanne wants to know if my dad always walked over the lawn in his golf shoes <laughs> with the spikes in them. Um, would that be good to do after seed planting? Uh, it aerates the soil. I don't see any advantage to that. Um, I mean, if you, it, no, I don't see any, I don't see any advantage to that, you know, aerating the soil after you've planted seed. My, my concern is that you may be pushing the seed too deep into the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, once you've planted, you've got to let it go. You want those seeds to remain in that top eighth to a quarter inch of soil. That, that's really, it's good for aerating turf, um, but I don't think you would need to do that in the case of a wildflower garden. Okay. And um, here's a good question for Anne that when I struggle with, will other wildflowers grow in Sunshine Mimosa? I, I do. My, I, have, I have my Menarda, my bee balm grows fine. Um, my... Um, the uh, uh, the Mexican clover, uh, not the uh, Mexican clover, the the wild petunia grows fine. Um, it and also, um, yeah, things will come through it, especially the ones that are tall. They will come through it. Native grasses will come through it. Um, I've got asters out there; they come through it. What I find interesting, well, at least where we get frost or freezes, like I do here in Tallahassee, I get. Winter, I get my cool, I get my um, my landsleaf coreopsis and my salvia come up in the spring before the the mimosa really comes on. Um, so I don't have any problem with that. Um, so if you've got something that flowers early in the spring while the mimosa is still, you know, it's, the top growth is dead, you can have wildfires come up fine. And in one of my pictures, I, you know, the black eyed Susan came through that fine. Um, things will come up through it, yes. Um, but then, you know, once it comes on, there's not too much that's going to come through it, but some plants will come through. But just plant, you know, if you, you have the sunshine mimosa and you're in an area where the frost or freeze, plant something for the early spring before the mimosa comes on. Um, and I do, the native grasses come through it fine. 
I've had no, no problem with that. Okay, do you have any um, thoughts for what is a safe herbicide to use? <sighs> Boy, that's a good question. Um, if you wanna be super safe, um, you can use basically vinegar. That is a good contact herbicide. It only kills the top growth. It will only kill you know, annuals that don't have any kind of a, a root system where it can regenerate. That is effective on some plants. It doesn't kill everything. Um, but there's, there's, I mean, even those organic herbicides, those herbicidal soaps, they, are, they can be dangerous to use because it, it's a strong soap, can burn your eyes or it's very irritating. So even an organic herbicide, you have to be really careful with. If Roundup is used properly, it's fine, but you've got to be really careful with it. I, I like the grass herbicides because they don't hurt my wildflowers. Um, I consider that one of the safer ones because it's ready to use. It comes in a, a bottle. You don't have to mix it. There's no disposal. You just squirt the grass and in a few weeks, the grass is dead. Um, but, you know, hand, I only use it as a last resort. Um, I wouldn't use any chemical unless I really need to. And most of the time, the only thing I really need to use is, is a grass herbicide that kills a centipede grass in my wildfire planting. Um, and I consider that one of the safer herbicides because it only kills grasses. Um, but herbicides only as a last resort. Okay, just um, uh, we're running a little uh, shy on time. So just a few, a couple more questions. Um, after sowing the seeds, do we need to rake them uh, to cover them or? No, no, don't, don't just touch roll. Them. No, the only thing, if, if you want to put a little bit of mulch down, the only thing I would put down on a seeded area is a very thin layer of pine straw. Um, that will help to moderate the temperature a little bit and it may help to hold in the moisture. But I wouldn't, I would put only enough down so that you could still see that if you can't see the ground, it's too much, but a very thin layer of pine straw. That's the only thing I would recommend putting down over a seeded area, but enough so you could still see the bare ground. That will help a little bit because it will moderate the temperature. You won't get those big temperature fluctuate fluctuations and it will help to hold in a little bit of moisture. Right. Um, how do you create and maintain pathways in your in your um, yard field? How I do mow. Oh, you mow. <laughs> I just mow every every few, every few weeks. I, I just take the lawnmower setter on a really high setting and just mow mow a path from my front yard to my backyard. Okay. I just set it high. Yep. Um, Carrie wants to know. She's in uh, South Florida Zone Ten. Uh, you said something different needs to be done for St. Augustine grass. What should I do? If you have St. Augustine grass, you're not going to be able to plant a wild, wildfires into that. Um, it's either I, I would recommend first option would be soil solarization. Um, that's what I would recommend. Just till everything under at least you know at least eight ten inches deep, but but use soil solarization. Um, if you've got a really huge patch, um, you may have to, you know, that forms such a thick thatch. Um, you've almost got to till that under. My centipede is not nearly, it doesn't come out as thick as, as a St. Augustine. But I, and if I had St. Augustine, I would probably end up at this, knowing what I know, I would, I would till it and use um, soil solarization. All righty, and one more question, and this is from Mimi. Um, she wants, she's, she can't wait to try solarization. She wants to know if she can do it now. Um, she is in North Florida. It's pushing it because, boy, it's a, almost a little late. Um, boy, I'm looking at the date. It might work. I mean, you, I would, I would experiment with it. I would do a very small patch to see how effective it is, but I wouldn't put a big investment into it. I would just do a small patch to see if it works. But it's it's getting a little late to do it. Plus, it it needs a good a minimum of six weeks under that high sun, and then the sun is getting you know definitely getting lower in the sky now. You could try it, but I would only do a small patch just to see if how well it works. Um, and the way to know if it works, it, you know, once it's done, is you uncover it and see what you know, irrigate it a little bit and see if any weeds come up. If not, you know you've got it. Um, yeah, I would I would experiment with that. Listen, I, it's pushing it's pushing it right now in, in North Florida. No doubt about that. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think we're going to have to end it here. Um, if you do have your other questions or your question didn't get answered, feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org. And Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and.
we, we look forward to seeing you all on another webinar. Thank you.